Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Andres Bokoyne, President and CEO of the Jewish Funders Network, an organization that works with Jewish funders at the individual and collective levels to improve the quality of their giving and maximize their input as they make the change that they want to see in the world. Andres has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Andres, for joining us today. My pleasure. So you function as a type of community foundation for donors who wish to ensure that their funding is having maximal impact. Talk about how that, that works in practice. Correct. What we, try to, what we try to do is we try to make sure that there is more philanthropy and there is better philanthropy. In other words, we try to maximize the breadth and the impact of Jewish philanthropy. I first aside to talk about what is Jewish philanthropy, and there's been volumes written about what makes philanthropy Jewish as opposed to secular. So you're going to do this, you're going to take these volumes and compress it compress into it, a sound Compress mic. it, okay. because we had, we had these uh, debates internally, and we have people funding mainly secular causes uh, as well as Jewish causes. So we say that is... Jewish philanthropy is philanthropy that, that is done informed by Jewish values or by the Jewish identity of the funder. So we try to maximize the impact of that philanthropy, meaning that there's more of it, but there's also that is more uh, strategic, impactful, and connected, more networked. And that comes from the realization that the issues we're facing, both in the Jewish community, in, in the world at large are too complex and too intractable for a single funder to tackle them alone. So yes, we are a platform for connection among funders, but we also try to leverage the, um, the place or the, the power of the network as, as a vector of change. In other words, we believe that funders working together can affect deep change in the society. Now we're totally agnostic about where the funding goes. We have people from all walks of life, left, right, from the more orthodox to the more secular. But you're not agnostic as to how effective that funding is, no correct. matter where it goes. Correct, correct. I, 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 um, I would say the opposite of a agnostic on that. I would challenge funders um, all the time regarding that. And, Ye One of the things that I try to tell funders is that the natural state of philanthropy is underperformance. Because philanthropy lacks those feedback mechanisms that you have in a business. In a business, you're bad, you go bankrupt. So part of your job is to try and finesse that dynamic and try to bring a little bit more truth, in fact, a lot more truth into the dynamic of, uh, of the relationship uh, between the funders and and the grantees, what type of techniques do you use to shine a light, to create truth, to create that dialogue that is based in fact as opposed to image? Right. So one of the main ways for us to, to sort of improve the quality of, of philanthropy is by forcing people to challenge their views, by listening to others, by listening to other funders, uh, listening, uh, uh, listening to grantees, uh, in, a, in a safe way, of course, we don't want to burn bridges, but to expose them to that. And to, and to expose them to new methodologies of measuring, new methodologies of, um, of, of uh, grant evaluation and the like. Um, the Jewish community has a, has a compounded problem here that because of the weight of communal philanthropy, federated giving and the whole thing, independent philanthropy is paradoxically less sophisticated than in the secular world because we got to the world of uh, independent philanthropy a little later. Right. So we, one of the things we try to do is help the community catch up with techniques, with, with new methodologies and new technologies of funding. Now you take these techniques, these ideas, and you make them freely available to others. Talk about your online resource center. So we try to be a clearinghouse for the latest you know, state-of-the-art philanthropic uh, technology, both for our members, we're a membership organization, for the funders that are members of the Jewish Funders Network, 
but also for the community at large. In other words, I encourage nonprofit to look at our uh, resource center because it's very important for them to understand how funders are thinking. Right. Uh, our job at, at, the, at the network is to try to build bridges uh, among funders uh, within the funding community, but also between funders and nonprofit. And for that, sharing the same language is very important. Like one of the things that happen a lot is that funders, especially those that are very professional, they speak in, in a specific jargon that the, that the nonprofits don't get. So we actually encourage that through our uh, resource center uh, for people to look into that and to and to start conversations uh, on these uh, resources. We, we also, by the way, we do, we do salons. We don't believe that a, a piece of literature in and of itself, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a key thing. The key thing is really the conversation that that literature can spark. So you actually are creating a symmetrical training environment in which you are not only helping your um, people who are interested in engaging with you on a philanthropic basis, they want to donate, you're helping to educate also the recipients of those gifts, those people who are trying to position themselves to be the recipients of gifts. You try to bridge the gap between quantifiable measures and uh, qualitative measures. You try to convey techniques on both sides in a way to raise the bar on philanthropy, uh, philanthropy across various fields. Correct, and, and I would go one step further, which is the distinction between grantor and grantee is blurred today. Right. Meaning, I look at it as a partnership. Mm -hmm. In other words, both grant maker and grantee, they have defined a specific problem they want to solve. Right. A specific value that they want to give to the society, and they decide to work on it together. A, pr a specific result that they would like to Correct. achieve. A Correct. change in the world. All right. One of the things, one of the things I, 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 I talk a lot with funders is, don't tell me what you fund. You know, people tell me, well, I fund uh, healthcare. No, don't tell me what you fund. Tell me what problem you want to solve, and then we got to find together who's your best, your best partner to solve to work on solving that problem, both in the funding community and in the nonprofit community. But it's going to break that uh, dichotomy that is not helpful, frankly, between you know, grantee and grant maker. And some of this has to do also with trust, with, uh, with communication, with um, uh, process, the process steps, milestones, the projects are, are appropriately managed. You're talking about management excellence. There's a, there's a whole variety of different elements that go into these to these deals. As you develop a series of agreements, do you provide a contractual or grant framework in which uh, these um, these relationships unfold, or are these? Do, do, do you then say, "God bless you, have an agreement, go <laughs> off and do what you want to do"? Um, you know, you know, if you know one philanthropic partnership, you know one philanthropic partnership. Right. In other words. It, everything's unique. Everything's unique, and and each situation is, is going to be different. So we try to help them formalize. We don't believe in the, I mean, nobody's going to sue anybody <laughs> on a contract. Uh, we try to just create a relation of trust. And by doing that, people can agree on, on things. And, and we, we do give them a taxonomy, sort of a, a s different models that they can use. But we don't, we don't bring them all the way there. I, I think that the most important thing is for funders to understand the, concern, the concerns and the needs of nonprofits, especially in what it brings, you mentioned management, you mentioned process and the like. Uh, and that touches the issue of uh, capacity building and uh, overhead, which is something that funders don't always recognize or don't always give the critical importance that it has. I want to fund the child, but, but I don't want to fund the the infrastructure that allows someone who teaches the child. Correct, correct, and, 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 uh, and it's unfair because the only sector that is subject to that scrutiny in terms of uh, overhead is the nonprofit sector. 
Like I had a coffee in Starbucks, you know. Right. I, I don't know what their overhead is. I like the coffee, the price was reasonable. Uh, actually, I don't like the coffee, and the, but whatever, for <laughs> argument's sake. <laughs> there's, you know, I, I, it wouldn't occur to me to ask for their overhead. I flew uh, in an airplane two, two days ago. I hope that they have a high overhead, that they don't skimp on pilot training or on pilot uh, psychological tests, as right. we saw this day. Or, or in maintenance, only when or it in having two pilots in the cockpit, or in having two pilots in the cockpit, only when it comes to nonprofit, we get w we we make the issue of uh, overhead and make a make it or break it issue, and that's very harmful. It's very harmful because it creates you know what uh, some uh, some people have called a, a, a starvation cycle in right. the nonprofit, meaning. You have less capacity, you're worse off, that you, you then invest even less in uh, capacity and you start a downward spiral. So the first thing, going back to the issue of partnership between nonprofits and, and funders, is to understand the need for long-term capacity uh, building, which is critical. If you were to start taking away some of those foundational elements, you take away financial oversight, you take away metrics, you take away computer systems, which in this day and age are so important. Right. You take away management training, and you theoretically just have programs, and then everything falls apart because it's built on vapor. You can't have programs that deliver anything unless you can measure what you're delivering. You can't run your organization unless you're controlling finances. Today, if you don't have systems, essential computer systems, Absolutely. you can't even write a sentence. You but, but it's even worse. It's even worse because when the context was predictable, you could more or less live on the concept of peak uh, capacity. Right. Because you know that nothing unexpected is going to happen. Today, we live in a time when something uh, unexpected and uh, dramatic can happen at any time. In the, in the Jewish community, a lo lot of Jewish funders actually faced this problem uh, during the last summer, during the, during, the, uh, during the Gaza war. A lot of nonprofits actually collapsed because they didn't have extra capacity to deal with the demands that the war would, was pushing on them. And it seems that there's a catastrophe that occurs every day. Every um, day. If you look at what happened during the Madoff scandal, which was completely unpredicted and had a dramatic effect um, on uh, particularly Jewish organizations and Jewish causes, uh, or at least those that were funded by, uh, by, by members of the community. Um, it had a dramatic negative effect, and you actually stepped into the breach and right. tried to ameliorate that. So that was a very unusual move. Talk about right. a little bit about that program. The idea was to provide, uh, to create a, f a fund that would provide breach funds for people to get on their, on their feet again. Um, it, was, uh, it was very brave, it was very successful, but it highlighted, as you said, the, the, um, the need of having mechanisms to deal with the uh, unexpected. You know, meaning, um, and when you force organizations to operate at peak uh, capacity, you are, you are like a LaGuardia Airport like a little delay of five minutes in one flight. Cascades throughout. Cascades throughout. And, and nonprofits are always operating like that. So any major disturbance causes that. And it can be a war, it can be a financial crisis, it can be made of, it can be a, a, a hurricane. Like it we can had be in New York the transition City. of a chief executive. It can be a board transition. It could be a loss of a, a, of a contract. It could be the closing of, of two or three partners that are part of your uh, supply ecosystem in terms of, of whatever services you're providing. It could be a, a thousand 100%. different things. And you have no capacity, you have no buffer, and your ability to plan is, is hampered because, God forbid, one should actually be funding someone who plans for these things. Yeah, and, and sometimes, you know, we as funders, I, I carry a funder's hat, and I'm self-critical of that because sometimes we, we want to have it both ways. Right. We don't want to fund overhead, but then we criticize nonprofits that didn't have a contingency plan for the case of a hurricane or a war or whatever it is. And say, well, 
we're not funding overhead, and a contingency plan is a, a textbook definition, uh, you know, a textbook case of overhead spending. One of the things that funders are learning, and I'm trying to, you know, spread that because I think it's critical. The only predictor of a good grant is the management in the nonprofit that is implementing that grant. It's not the size of the nonprofit. It's not, or the most reliable predictor, let's say, of a good grant is the human resource that is going to be implementing that. We have a huge crisis of talent in the nonprofit world, in the Jewish community. You know, Tolstoy said, Jews are like, you know, everybody else, just a little bit so. So in the Jewish community, we have a huge crisis of talent um, in, in, in the nonprofit sector. Uh, somebody said that in the, in the next five years, 400 uh, CEOs in the Jewish community are going to be stepping down, and we have no idea where the people are coming from. We, we actually uh, spearheaded something called the Leadership Pipelines Initiative, which tries to look systemically at the issue of talent in the Jewish community. And it's very tough. It's very tough for people to understand that there are many moving pieces in the talent puzzle. One of them, probably the most difficult one, is to make nonprofit attractive. One of the things that was fascinating about your career is seeing how that has unfolded. You grew up in, in one country, you've moved to other countries, you've had a very international career, you've had a career that has spanned a number of organizations. Just describe a little bit about that life story that led you to this place. Um, I think it's a very postmodern story. And um, I started in the corporate sector. Um, I also was trained as a rabbi, although I was never ordained, but I was trained as a rabbi. And as my mom would say, you know, being a rabbi is not a good job for a Jewish boy. <laughs> so I also studied business, and that's how I got a, into the corporate world. And your family had immigrated from Poland to from Argentina? From Poland to Argentina in the 30s. And um, they were very uh, secular, socialist uh, family. And we grew up um, in a strongly Jewish family, but very secular, which is something that for this country is a little, it's a little odd. Um, our Jewish identity was not um, uh, expressed in, in terms of faith, rather in terms of uh, belonging, in terms of uh, connections in terms of, of culture, of history, and, the and values. So it was, it was a surprise that I went to study to be a rabbi. rabbi. And I, but um, uh, although it's not a surprise that I'm doing something connected with the Jewish community, and then from there I moved to France um, when I was responsible for the programs of the JDC, the Joint Distribution Committee, which is a Jewish organization that helps. Jewish communities in distress. Um, and I was in charge of working in some parts of uh, East Europe mm -hmm. uh, during the fall of communism. During the transition. During there. the transition. From there, um, I was uh, headhunted to go to Canada, to Montreal, to run the Jewish Federation there that wanted to run a process of change. And they wanted somebody that was both an outsider but also understood the dynamics of, of the Jewish community. From there, I got uh, hired to run the Jewish Funders Network, which is uh, been doing for the last uh, three and a half years and been an amazing ride so far. And in many, in many respects, a continuation of your previous work to try and redefine how philanthropy works, scaled now for the different demands. Correct. I mean, what... When they hired me at the Jewish Funders Network, I said, I have no interest in running a trade association of funders. Right. Nothing wrong with that. You, right. know, you want to have that, that's fine. But I find not you know, excitement in that. What I want is that we use the network, as I said before, as a vector of change. In other words, that we use the power that we have as philanthropists to change realities, to improve the quality of communal life, to uh, improve the nonprofit world, etc. And um, 
you know, and yes, we serve our members. That's that's a that's a critical part of what we do. And you serve your grantees. And we serve the community at large. So over the next years, we're going to continue to see change in the field. What are your next concerns and what are your next initiatives? This might sound a little too philosophic, but it has very you know, concrete practical implications. We see the Jewish Founders Network as a bridge between the individual drive and creativity, which many funders have, and the uh, collective. In the in the in the nineties and twentieth century, it was all about the collective, you know, the federation, the political party. The in the twenty first century, it's all about me, individual, the, the the sovereign self. They call it. How do we bridge between these two worlds? And how and do you create this virtuous uh, collaboration amongst individuals who maintain their individual identities, but they form those collaborations? fluidly according to the objectives that Correct. they wish to to achieve not always with the same group it won't always be in, in the past the philanthropy would be rooted through the federation and no matter whether it was education or this or that or the other thing it would go through the federation right now that is no longer the case so if you want to engage in different types of philanthropies you might want to configure your networks very flexibly and you don't have just one you have you have i mean today we have hyphenated identities and we have hyphenated uh, in, you know uh, uh, networks and and uh, communities uh, that that's the way we live we live today our diets are you know sushi latin food uh, french food our music is a mix everything is a mix we don't have a single loyalty today we don't have a single allegiance and Spokoni, thank you so much for sharing this vision for not only the Jewish Funders Network, but also for others across the field. And thank you so much for your insight. Thank you. Thank you.